When you're ready, Grant, the floor is yours. Um, hello, everybody. And I think I should say, um, uh, we really can say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, um, uh, given the locations that are known to me. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, we, um, we, uh, this is being hosted out of Stanford University. And now, Stanford University sits on the ancestral and unceded land of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. So, as I think um, most of you know, uh, together with Stefania uh, of the uh, Stanford Archaeology Center and the Anthropology Department, and supported by Stanford Global Studies, and I think um, we have a co sponsored uh, uh, today. Um, is that right? Uh, Stefania yeah. will uh, uh, let me will, uh, confirm that. Um, uh, we are hosting uh, this uh, series called Reframing Enslaved Pasts. Uh, today's talk will be the fourth of six uh, and in the past we've uh, we focused on um, Indian Ocean uh, uh, but uh, also uh, Atlantic uh, histories. Uh, today's uh, topic uh, is uh, uh, will be uh, uh, will uh, focus on the Atlantic world. Uh, the overall plan is uh, to think about uh, the the way data works in the study of enslaved uh, pasts. Uh, given that there's so many digital projects, websites, and and so on. Uh, our series has been to bring well-established projects into contact with newer ones, including uh, one that several of us have been uh, uh, exploring in an Indian Ocean uh, context. Uh, all presenters have been asked to address the following questions. What are the scholarly goals and opportunities driving your research project? What are the affordances <coughs> and the challenges involved in your chosen approach. How would you describe your use of databases? So with these questions, we aim to facilitate a discussion about critical data practices around enslaved pasts, focusing on methodologies. Um, and uh, so, um, yes, we, um, so, uh, Stefania, shall I hand it over to you at this uh, point to introduce uh, today's speakers? Sure, sure. So yes, as uh, Professor Parker was saying, this uh, workshop is uh, sponsored by the Global Stanford Global Studies, but also today is uh, um, co-sponsored by Stanford's Abbasi program, program in Islamic Studies. So as uh, uh, today, it's a really great creation for me to introduce uh, um, the speakers. And I will start by introducing uh, Baba Carfo. Baba Carfo is, is an associate professor at the Ecole Normale Supérieure, Université Sheikh and Job of Dakar in Senegal. And he also uh, the founding director of the Institut d'Etudes en uh, The next speaker will be um, Professor Richard Roberts. Professor Richard Roberts is a merito professor at the Francis and Charles Field Professor of History here at Stanford. We have the great pleasure also to have uh, Ibrahim Sek. He is an associate professor in the history department of university, Sheikh and Job in the, of Dakar. Um, professor Sek is now holding the position of director, or director of research of the Whitney Plantation Slavery Museum located in Louisiana. Then we have the great pleasure to have Rebecca Wolf. Rebecca Wolf is a, a visiting assistant professor of history in the Helmington College. This uh, fascinating team today will talk uh, to us about uh, the register of slave liberation in colonial Senegal. Please join me, welcome all of them. Who would like to start the slide? Well, what we would like to do, and I think uh, we have a PowerPoint that we want to present, and we want then to have uh, 
participation <clears throat> from Babakar and Ibrahima in relationship to the, the PowerPoint, which I think describes the project. And then we will open up things for, for questions and answers. We'd also like to take this moment to, to welcome the students in Rebecca's class. So Rebecca. Hello, can you hear me now? Okay, sorry about that. So um, thank you for that introduction uh, for my class and thank you Stefania and Grant and everyone for facilitating this workshop. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen, um, you know, given the many um, collaborators on this project will be sort of passing the baton, so to speak here and there. But as Richard said, our aim in our short presentation is really to provide some background to the project, including a little bit of historical context because um, as you've noted, um, people involved with this workshop series come from very different sort of geographic perspectives and then we'll share our work to date, but it's certainly one of the more, um, and it's still in its beginning stages, although we're very pleased with our work so far and we really look forward to your comments and, and suggestions. So with that, I'll share the screen. Okay. Great, so can people see this okay? Okay, wonderful. So um, as I just said, right today in this talk, we'll be doing some quick, very, very quick historical background um, to explain why our source space and our project um, is of potential um, historical significance. Um, we'll then describe the sources themselves as well as our analysis to date before transitioning into what we see as the major historiographic and pedagogical possibilities. Um, and then finally, you know, we're really keen to hear from this group, which has so much experience on uh, digital histories of enslavement and emancipation, some of the next steps and challenges we're facing and get your input on that. So we'll start off with this quote and I'll let you take a look at it for a moment. So, we're beginning here because this so pithily um, gets to what um, is of historical interest in our, in our project and our source space, because what you find in Senegal during the, the second half of the 19th and very first years of the 20th century is uh, significant numbers of enslaved people um, in what is now Senegal, at that time colonial Senegal, actually liberating themselves and redeeming themselves, um, both through their own efforts and through a context uh, that was created by the nature of French colonial administration at the time. So it opens up on fascinating issues of agency of enslaved people at a particular historical conjuncture. Right, so just to give you some grounding in space, uh, here is a map um, that shows the myriad uh, kingdoms, polities, ethnicities in the region of Senegambia, so marked by the Senegal River, Gambia River, uh, in the mid 1800s. And you'll notice, like I said, there are many different groups, many different polities. This is important because what's critical to know is that the heterogeneity of um, polities, states and peoples created situations wherein there was an uneven landscape of enslavement and liberation. And this in turn led to um, the self-emancipation of many, the self-liberation of many enslaved peoples. Um, it's important to know as well that slavery and enslavement has a long history in this region. Um, that's while part of the Atlantic world and other ways somewhat separate from it, there's a dialectical interplay between the greater Atlantic context and also internal dynamics of enslavement. So um, for many, many centuries, slavery as an institution and enslaved people were integral parts of society, just taking one uh, ethnicity wool off society. Um, so different ways, um, different types of enslaved people. Um, so I've listed a couple of the main ones here. Um, and just to highlight something important, um, war and conflict was a major generator of enslavement and enslaved people. 
And so um, this plays a critical role in understanding slavery in this region at this time because of because um, conflict driven in part by internal dynamics and in part due to encroachment by colonial powers was creating a highly conflictual context in the late 1700s, early 19th century. Okay. Um, and so, yes, we don't need to linger on this too long, but you can see some of the salient features of enslavement in Wolof society as one example. Um, according to a French survey, which we would be right to be skeptical of, you know, it's hard to ascertain how accurate it was, but remarkably suggested that up to two thirds of population in some areas in 1904 was enslaved. So really uh, ubiquitous um, and part of the context that we're exploring in this project. As I mentioned before, um, and as the first map I showed you might have suggested, there was highly um, complex and um, dynamic uh, political uh, situation in this region at this time. And uh, as I mentioned as well, the encroaching colonial power of France also was a destabilizing factor. So here um, I've put a photo of Samora Torre, who um, is a really um, critical historical figure, um, especially um, in the history of Mali. Um, just to kind of remind us that um, ongoing um, struggles and conflict was a major generator of enslavement up until uh, French rule came into place. Okay, and so I'll turn things over to um, Richard to talk a little bit about the rest of the historical context, and then we'll speak about the project itself. And Richard, I'm happy to change slides for you as required. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is um, just 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 one route of slave. So it's one route of slavery of of, of slaves moving into the Senegambia region. The second major route, which is not mentioned in this particular map, is up the Gambia River. And many of these both have their origins. Many of the sources of slaves, and this is one of the things we will be looking at in the registers that we have, will be where the slaves remember where they came from. And this is part of that story about the difference between slaves, trade slaves, and slaves born in the house of their masters. And that becomes an important element. Next one, please, Rebecca. <clears throat> so the, one of the important things about Senegal is that Senegal was a very small colony, particularly in the first half of the 19th century. It had two major French settlements, which was Saint-Louis and Goree. And it's important to remember that Senegal was a colony of commerce, not a colony of cultivation or production. So that this becomes a really important aspect of the story of what's happening in Senegambia itself and the place of slaves in French expansion, French colonial expansion. <clears throat> so what's important is the you have the two in, in 1848. 1848 is an important moment because 1848 is the second French Republic. And in, during the second French Republic, um, the Article 7 liberates slaves. And they liberate slaves based on the well-established principle that applies to metropolitan France, that French soil liberates. And so that slaves in Saint Louis and Gore were actually liberated. But many of the masters, and this is a really important issue, many of the, of the masters who owned slaves were, Af were African masters themselves. And many of the slaves in San Louis and Gore were, uh, some were domestics, but many of them had skills. They were urban workers, urban carpenters, masons, but also sailors. And they played a very important role in the commerce that was necessary. So 1848 becomes a really important thing. <clears throat> the, French are, the French are very ambivalent because the 
commerce depended upon a good relationship with neighboring African polities. And so the abolition of slavery bumped up against changes that are going on in African polities themselves. Next slide. This goes back to the slide that, <clears throat> that Rebecca had mentioned before, but it's really important to bear in mind the sets of changes that are going on from the middle of the, of the 19th century onward, which is the period that we're focusing on here. And <clears throat> what happens during this is that we have a number of very important processes of change that come together and create a really dynamic uh, and politically revolutionary moment in Senegal and Senegambia itself. And the first is <clears throat> the expansion of, of French empire itself or French colonialism, which bumps up against a second really important trajectory of change which is an Islamic revolutionary pattern, which is resulting in the remobilization of, of Islam, the place of Islam in African polities themselves. It has a longer history than the mid 19th century, but it's articulated dramatically during this period. And there's a much more militant moment that begins to take place from the mid 19th century onward. <clears throat> and that's associated with uh, al Haj Umar Tal and the Tijaniya movement. But that spills off and has significant impact within Senegal, Senegalese polities themselves. So the second really important or third really important element that's going on is a transformation in the nature of commerce itself. So what's happening now in commerce is the growth of peanut production. Peanut production is now eclipsing the importance of former enslavement and slave trade, but also the gum trade. Gum Arabic is an important ingredient in textile production, and it's grown mostly along the Senegal River, particularly the northern edge of the Senegal River. And, and, uh, and African slaves were widely used in the cultivation of of um, gum Arabic. But peanuts begin to take off, earliest take off somewhere in, in, along the Gambia River. Peanuts are imported from the New World and they begin to take off at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th. But by the middle of the 19th century, they are taking place in expanding dramatically in the regions of Baol and um, Kayor, it becomes the important peanut basin. And this is important for our story because there's in, with the increased demand for peanuts, there's an increased demand for labor. And labor is taking the form of both enslaved people, but also slaves who are then moving themselves to become free and take advantage of the opportunities to participate in the expanding peanut market. <clears throat> um, so that we know that 85% um, of the export of peanuts during this period comes from those two regions of Baal and Kayor. And you can see those on the map itself. They're the most Western <clears throat> parts of Senegal. Could we have the next slide? So this goes back to really important questions about what is the legal conditions that are allowing for enslaved people to seek their own freedom. And of course, we have to be really careful about what that means. And we'll come and we want to raise that one of the questions for our discussion. <clears throat> but in terms of the context, the legal context, which I think is a really important aspect here, and that is, <clears throat> The French colonial governor, Federbe, who had some Algerian experience before, but also some Atlantic experience, comes to Senegal with a vision of both the expansion of French colonialism, but also a careful question about how to proceed without alienating African neighbors. 
1855, he asks the Procureur General, the Attorney General of the colony, for legal guidance as to how to apply that Article 7 of 1848. And the Attorney General responds by saying, well, there are two aspects to this. The first is the law of, of, of 1848 applies only to citizens, not to subjects. And so that begins to introduce this fascinating component of what constitutes a protectorate. So French law does not apply to anyone but citizens. And most of the owners of slaves are Africans rather than French citizens. The second part <clears throat> of uh, Carrère's response to Federbe was to say that what constitutes French soil is ultimately very constrained. It is ultimately the French soil that liberates now will only be the interior of French posts or French forts that are being extended gradually. The rest of the territory is protectorate and therefore does these, these particular concepts, the French soil liberates, does not apply. And that creates, the, that creates a really important aspect because for those enslaved people who wish to be free, they have to walk to these French posts themselves. And I think that becomes a very important aspect of the agency that we see in the registers of liberation that begin to be recorded. These uh, decisions by the Attorney General become enshrined in decrees in 1857, and that's when we begin to see the registers that are at the core of this project. That's where we begin to see them operating. Next slide. <clears throat> Just want to mention the village de liberté, which is another option, but they take place a bit later in our story. Village de liberté are introduced by, um, by, by in the upper river region of Senegal, towards the boundary with what becomes Mali. It's a, a military district, and it was introduced by Lieutenant Colonel Galliani in 1887. There are many varieties of this. They take place mostly in the upper river, upper region, upper river region in this military district. They extend over the course of the 1880s and 90s and into the early part of the 20th century throughout French controlled territory. They take place, there are two different kinds. There's the civilian ones, but also ones run by Catholic missionaries. <clears throat> Uh, next slide. Great. Um, thanks so much, Richard, for that. And so the goal with this preliminary section of our presentation is just to explain the historical context that, as Richard said, led to the generation of records that we use in our project. So now I'll speak a bit about those um, before we transition to showing you our work to date. Okay. So um, as Richard noted, there the registers of liberated slaves um, are a very important source that begin to be produced in the mid 19th century, specifically 1857. And the sources ultimate original home are in the National Archives of Senegal. Um, but a major facilitating facet of our project is that, I mean, Richard could say the specific date, but many decades ago with the agreement of the archives, he brought to Stanford University libraries microfilm copies of these sources. So they'd been sort of living in the library, not to our knowledge being used. And as you'll see in a moment, there are certain attributes of the registers themselves that we felt lent them particularly well to a digital history project. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, but of course, this has been a huge facilitating factor for us because you know while we began this several years ago before, um, COVID, it's just been very, very helpful to have them located both in Senegal and at Stanford. And furthermore, we were able to get them digitized. So that's really increased their accessibility. 
And as we'll talk about later, one of our objectives is to find a way to share the digitized registers as part of our um, ultimate website. But, oh yes, and so like any uh, digital project, we have a you know large and growing team, although um, certainly not the biggest by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so want to make sure just to pause and attribute uh, various people who have worked on the project uh, to date. So the first four of us are here today. Um, and so as this project grows and develops, we anticipate having more people come on board and we'll talk more about the specifics, uh, hopes of that in a moment. But ultimately we take some of the earlier highly influential digital projects on enslavement and liberation as our inspiration and as our touchstone. And that's why I, I think I speak for all of us when I say we we're very excited to participate in this workshop because it really speaks directly to this crucial and important set of work. So um, at least for the Atlantic world context, which we arguably fit in, although in certain ways, um, we are a little different. I'll talk about that. Um, the seminal project is, of course, um, the Slave Voyages project. I think it might have a new name um, as it's been uh, rehomed at Rice. But at any rate, since the 1990s, um, this project has had such an immense influence on the possibilities of digitization in terms of understanding uh, enslavement and emancipation in the Atlantic world. So absolutely massive. Um, in no way are we at this scale, but um, since the outset, we felt very strongly that our project is an important complement to this work that focuses on transatlantic dynamics. Because as Richard and I mentioned, the focus of the registers is very much on liberation within colonial Senegal, so intra-African dynamics, about which previous uh, digital projects in the Atlantic context have by and large been quite silent. Um, and so many aspects of previous work, um, such as the um, really excellent uh, and searchable data set of slave voyages are very much our ultimate goal. And we think something that our source base is very suited for. Um, so, and furthermore, um, ultimately we also were are very uh, taken with the various visualizations and mapping that other projects have done. Um, and as Richard and I discussed, there, there is such a critical geographic dimension to enslaved Africans' self-liberation. Uh, where you were and where you went was absolutely critical in terms of codifying and establishing uh, liberation. So um, in many ways, we're very, um, you know, we're very enthusiastic about the geospatial possibilities of this work as well, but um, we've encountered a number of challenges in that regard that we'll talk about later in the presentation. Richard. So let me jump in and, 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 and mention that I think one of the really important questions that we need to address is the different paths to freedom. And there are multiple different routes to this and they have different meanings for the people who are who who find themselves at the end of this trajectory so we need to be able to differentiate manumission where essentially manumission is the power of masters to liberate slaves and essentially that reinforces the power of masters over slaves because they have the power to liberate them we also draw a distinction between legal emancipation, which is essentially a state program that decrees that enslavement has ended or that slavery is over. And in other cases, and this is another important aspect of how we compare with other uh, digital projects that are out there. And we'll talk about this in a moment there is a large body of sources that refer to the ways in which the anti-slavery squadrons that were used to suppress the slave trade in the course of the 19th century ultimately captured slave ships and liberated the slaves on them. 
But it's important to draw a distinction here because those liberated Africans, as they're called, were liberated by European powers. And one of the things that makes a difference in the records that we have is that the records that we have show enslaved people using their own agency to seek the end of slavery. So one of the big questions we have to ask is what is the meaning of agency in terms of the outcome of ending slavery? Of course, we're not talking about freedom in here because freedom is a very ambiguous concept. It's worth probing what it means, but we know that post slave societies are filled with all sorts of coercion that constrain freedom. So we have to be really careful how we use that. We are really cognizant also of the fact that in different contexts, such as Havana, such as Cuba, for example, the work of Rebecca Scott indicates that even though slave, slavery was ended, some slaves continued to buy their own freedom through self-redemption because it gave them a different status. It gave them agency in acquiring their own end of slavery. And we see the same thing happening in Northern Nigeria with the uh, records that Hogendorn and Lovejoy have assembled. There are about 102,000 cases of, of, of enslaved people going to courts seeking their own freedom, but having to do it through self-redemption or self-purchase. That's not the case in Senegal. In Senegal, the use registers of liberation show that enslaved people are moving to these French ports, forts or posts, asking for their own liberation and acquiring what's called freedom papers or patent de libération. And what we don't know is how many enslaved people simply walked away from their masters. And that becomes an important gap that we just don't know about. Next slide. This is a slide from a database, <clears throat> a liberated Africans database. And it shows the ways in which these Africans who were, who were captured on slave ships and liberated are being recorded. And these registers of liberation are useful in comparing them to what we have and what we're using in the Senegal uh, Liberation Project. Yes, and on that note, um, you know, this is a, an example of what the registers actually look like. And so, um, you know, this is really the crux of why we feel that this is an excellent source base for a digital uh, uh, application. And so just to explain quickly, each row represents an individual, a human who achieved liberation. So, um, and I'll, I'll talk about the columns in a moment, but you'll notice that um, they're not particularly data rich for each person. There's some important sort of basic biographic demographic information but you can't really tell a lot about a particular individual from the registers there on their own. However, um, all told, there are upwards or you know, approximately 30,000 Africans in these registers. So 30,000 rows. So our hope is that through um, working with these registers and bringing to bear digital interventions, we'll be able to tell a much richer story especially as Richard alluded to, to the agency of the individuals who liberated through their own locomotion. And since, I mean, it's a little hard to see because it's small, I've just typed what the columns are. So number uh, each year, there was a numerical number assigned to each person. So year plus number in general can be a unique identifier, although there's an occasional problems with that, the date, that they were the person was put into the registers. Um, declarant is the person to whom the individual was approaching to have their name put in. So this is often the procureur general or some official um, where the individual obtaining liberation was born, their name, their age, the name and age of their parents, and then also some information 
about uh, minors who may be in custody of another. So as you can see, this information, um, you know, taken across 30,000 people and nearly 50 years can tell a really important story about the, what drove the dynamics of and trends of liberation in Senegal during this time. Um, and so to that note, a big, big part of our work thus far has simply been taking what was on the registers themselves and trying to turn it into data that can then be used ultimately to create the type of searchable database like the Slave Voyages project has done. So this has obviously been a, a major task um, and one that we are approaching finishing. Um, and on that note, and we'll transition now to talking about some of our work so far, um, we have published an article um, in Esclavage and Post Esclavage, a French journal on uh, enslavement um, that shows essentially preliminary statistical analysis from 10,000 records from 1894 to 1903. And so we'll go fairly quickly in the interest of carving out ample time for discussion. Um, and Richard, just jump in at any point if you want to elaborate on any of the visualizations and statistical analysis, because I'll otherwise just sort of go quite fast. So don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, so as I said, there's around actually more than 10,000, almost 11,000 people uh, in the records for these years, 1894 to 1903. Um, again, um, the source for all the information that goes into the visualizations to come is ultimately the National Archives of Senegal via the uh, Registers of Liberation. And um, we have also previously published these images in our article. Okay, so this visualization actually looks at the entire period uh, of the registers. So from 1857 to 1903. Um, and the main thing I would point out here and uh, subsequently um, through our newest research assistant, Serena's work, we've realized that the actual N is a little bit higher than originally thought. Um, but you'll notice right away that there's certainly a, you know, a higher rate of liberations in the second half of the period. It's certainly not constant across time. And it's important to have the caveat that we do not know what proportion of all liberations are in these records it's really difficult to say how many enslaved Africans got up, left enslavement and never approached colonial officials to be put in the registers. So it's not a necessarily a 100% complete story of liberations during this period. But that being said, um, nearly 30,000 um, with all included individuals is certainly an important and significant number. And um, just to contextualize the visualizations to follow, um, we have about 38% of the total uh, individuals uh, in our analysis so far, um, just going by the percentage between 1894 and 1903. So yes, again, just gonna go kind of quickly to show the types of very basic analysis that we've done so far um, for this period. So we've looked at things like gender distribution over time, um, I would add that, you know, what's really helpful ultimately about visualizations like this is we hope they can point to directions for future research. So if you notice, um, you know, looking at uh, visualizations like this, we might ask, well, is there a period reason why um, there's a bigger differential in 1899, 1900 between male and female? For example, not saying that's necessarily the best research question, but we can maybe use this data set to point to important avenues for future research. Let me jump in there for a moment. Of course. So one of the one of the really important issues that this graph, for for example, raises, is that we've always understood that uh, within Africa, there tended to be more female slaves than male slaves. And this chart demonstrates that particular changes this component significantly by by actually indicating the number of African enslaved people who are seeking their own liberation constitute 53% of this group are female. And the barriers for female enslaved people to seek their own liberation are much higher 
because many of them are have various gender specific vulnerabilities, but they also have families and children. And the question is what happens with them? And that's part of what we also have discovered through the demographic material that we've, we've, we've looked at because many of them travel together with children. Rebecca? Yeah, great, thank you so much. Um, and on that note, we you know, look at other things, including age distribution among the people who seek liberation. Um, and and let me jump in here yeah, too. So what becomes significant about this is that the, 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 the demographic makeup of those who are seeking their own liberation in Senegal tends to be youthful. The largest number, uh, 48% are between the ages of 20 and 35. Those over 50 are very few, almost minuscule. And the next biggest chunk is essentially those under 15, which constitutes 26%. That, that's a really interesting demographic component that raises important questions for us to think about as to what is the meaning of these groups of people who are then leaving. The medium age in this cohort is 25.5 years. Rebecca? Yeah. Thank you for that. And, um, you know, and again, just to reiterate, um, even with the, you know, relatively preliminary analysis to date, um, we, we really feel that uh, these, these visualizations do throw up really important research questions. And I, I would just add as well, that as with any um, source, but especially any colonial source, we always have some reservations about the accuracy of uh, the records. So for example, Sometimes whoever was recording the registers would write, let's say 35 for one individual and then just draw ditto marks for the entire rest of the page. So things like that make us wonder, well, is, it's probably unlikely that everyone else was exactly the same age. People might not know their ages. However, we hope that the number of liberations will militate against any issues with the source base. Um, this is just a different way to look at the previous um, slide, so we'll continue in the interest of time. Um, so one thing that we're really interested in is trying to incorporate a seasonal and environmental dimension to this. So Richard's previous work um, using court records, um, you know, identified a link between, um, you know, I, you know better than me, Richard, but between like various seasons and likelihood of divorce. And so we are thinking, given the pronounced uh, differences between wet and dry seasons and how this impacts agricultural rhythms in Senegambia, also perhaps droughts, you know, is there a link between time of year and enslaved people seeking liberation? So this source base also allows us to open up on these sorts of questions, which we think will be very, very fruitful. Allow me to jump in here there. Yes, because I, I definitely butchered what your book is about, so I'm, I'm glad you can. <laughs> One of, one of the really fascinating things by looking at seasonality is that it demonstrates intentionality. So what we see happening is that 41% of those seeking their liberation do it during the period March to June, which is the period just before the need to put in the next planting season. So using this moment, there's an intentionality here. They're using this moment to leave so that they can set up a new life for themselves by beginning to farm. And so 41% take place just at this particular moment. And what's also intriguing, given the fact that so many seem to be moving into the peanut zone, is that the, the planting season for peanuts begins around June. So that period March to June is so crucial in understanding the kinds of awareness that these enslaved people have of their, of their paths to freedom and what that means. Next. Yeah, so I'll let you tackle this, Richard, if you want. So one early. of the things we were looking at here is whether or not, and, and one of the fascinating things that comes out of these records is the degree to which um, people are traveling with children. Because remember that a significant number, 26%, are under 15. 
And we're looking at the custody degree. And you can see that most of the enslaved people who are seeking their liberation are adults. And that's the 74%. They have their own custody. Other ones, the 10% are divided between mothers and fathers, but only 1% are allocated to their fathers, which means most of them are leaving with their mother. So that's an also a pretty fascinating question. And one of the other aspects that has emerged in the study of um, these paths to freedom in Senegal is this process of guardianship or tutel, which becomes formalized as a way of giving unaccompanied minors to guardians Many of these guardians are well-established Africans who then treat their guardian or their wards as potential slaves. And when, when we see the next slide, you'll see that the, the, how we divide up the gender division within these unaccompanied minors, we call them. They're not orphans. So that's one of the problems we've had with thinking about the terms. We drew on that debate that happened on the US border about unaccompanied minors. These are not orphans per se. They still have families, they still have parents. Sometimes they've been separated from their parents. But it's, so it's unclear, but they are unaccompanied and therefore they're, they are given through this process of tutel as a, as a ward to uh, well-established people in communities. And there's a system of patronage that goes on there. And the French colonial establish protections, but the protections are very weak. And so it's unclear what actually happens to these wars and how well, how well or not well they're treated. Next. Right, and so this just shows a longitudinal um, sort of, you know, across 1894, 1903, the distribution of uh, the ages of minors, um, although it's probably undebatable if 16 to 20, 21 to 25, but they are included as people who um, were given guardians, I believe. So just a different way to look at this data. Okay. Um, so we want to go pretty quickly for the rest of the presentation so we can get to your comments, but um, we do, as we've been saying throughout, see some very uh, significant historiographic and pedagogical possibilities for this work. Uh, so in terms of research applications, uh, we've noted how our, even our very preliminary visualizations throw up new questions and topics, and they'll hopefully allow a more fine-grained analysis of the dynamics of liberation and redemption during this era. Um, and absolutely crucially, and it's really a top priority is to make our data and the source original registers themselves searchable and available online in order to enable scholars globally and particularly those based in West Africa to work with this material and really make the most of this really uh, unusual and rich set of sources. But um, perhaps equally important um, is that we think there are really profound pedagogical applications of this work so that's why we'd like to uh, continue to do some statistical analysis and ultimately other sorts of visualizations that can show the change over time and also um, just kind of throw up these questions in different visual ways. And as, I, as we mentioned, this complements prior work. Um, further, we are working proactively um, with Trevor Getz and Rachel Petricelli to help to try to figure out how to design curriculum modules for secondary education. So this is in progress and we're hoping to um, have a series of workshops with secondary educators soon because we think that these sorts of questions would really enrich secondary curriculum throughout the United States and even elsewhere. And then lastly, we're working with FASTA and UCAD Dakar uh, to think of further pedagogical applications as well. So, um, with that, Richard will finish up and describe what he sees and what we actually what we all see as some of the big challenges and next steps for the project. Um, so, 
we, um, our task, of course, is to, we have multiple paths that are going forward. The first is to finish up the data collection itself. We're also very interested in, in thinking through about trying to visualize where the slaves seem to remember where they've come from and where they were born, to be able to develop the paths through which they have moved from being enslaved to being moved to being bought and then seeking their own liberation. So we have these data points. The question, of course, is how can we best visualize that? And we're working together with Tom Bassett at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, who has been a student of historical maps in West French West Africa. And we are trying to piece together some of these villages that may no longer be existing and try to figure out where they were located. We're also uh, moving to an issue regarding names. And I think that one of the important questions and ethical question that we're asking is what is our obligation or what is our role as scholars to respect in, in many places, and this is a really important ethical question that we want to address. And that is in, in, in many different places in the world, the, the meaning of former slave status and those who are descendant of former slaves. Uh, may pose stigmas. And we have to be respectful of those social conditions and cultural conditions. In some places of the world, there's an, an urgency to find historical roots, aid, ancestors. And in other places, there, there's efforts to try to forget those roots. So how do we proceed in that process? Because on the one hand, we want to humanize this experience by naming names, because these are real people with real identities and real histories. At the same time, we have to recognize that there are some potential harms we can do. And that becomes a very important ethical question for us to pursue. And we're really in, involved in working together with our colleagues in Senegal, and this would be an important moment to pass things on to Ibrahima and to Baba Karfal. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, indeed, it is a very fascinating project and um, uh, yeah, it's uh, also um, offer a bridge between the research and the, the teaching of contemporary issue in of, uh, in 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 in, in uh, Senegal schools. Um, uh, when we go through the curricula in secondary schools. We uh, we can notice that the the question of slaves is the, on the agenda of the schools and at um, uh, three at at, at least uh, two uh, different levels um, in the the student uh, around um, uh, twelve to thirteen you know, in the, which is the college, they have uh, uh, at least uh, um, a set of lessons linked to the issue of slavery and uh, the liberation, and uh, also the, the issue of the, the Atlantic, the development of the Atlantic Ocean. And um, uh, in, uh, we, when we continue, to go through the curriculum, we see also that uh, in the in the in the study of colonial Senegal and the development of the uh, uh, ruling um, the, the 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 setting of the ruling uh, uh, the ruling part, we have uh, uh, we face 
the issue of uh, liberation of slaves. We face also of the, the issue of uh, the development of Islam. And um, I think one important, one, one interesting question when um, Richard was talking about agency to freedom, um, we will explore the role played by the, the Marabu, the Islams, are the, are the religion of um, egality uh, and um, uh, um, in the tradition of uh, what did uh, uh, Sheikh Omar Tal, I think in, the, in that tradition, we, we see that there is uh, incompatibility and between uh, owning slaves and uh, um, being Muslim, you know. And I think that really the, uh, we probably in the, in the research, in the, in the research which need to be uh, continued and to be developed, I think there is the path, the path will be explored to see the role uh, played by the uh, Islamic uh, leaders, you know, in, um, in, um, in, um, in, the, in the evolution, you know, uh, which means that we need to explore new sources, you know, new sources, you know, we have uh, uh, the register is an important piece of um, uh, other, 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 other mark of um, liberation, but it, 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 is, it not show the whole picture of the freedom, of the path of, to, to freedom for slaves. You know, I think this is a, an important point we, we put on the corner, you know, and um, in developing the research, we will see how to involve students, you know, um, uh, exploring, developing research, you know, master at, at the level of master degree, and um, for just having scoop of potential possibility, you know, to see the uh, the more large picture of the the liberation. I think this is, a, this is just to say that you know, going behind. Uh, the research um, activity, we um, we intend, you know, to um, to uh, uh, set up a team. Uh, we already I already talked with the uh, uh, colleagues from uh, two schools, one in Dakar and um, uh, one in uh, in Rufisk, you know, and they are. Uh, our, my former student who were involved in the project on dossier personnel, and they are willing, you know, to experiment it using the, um, the data from the uh, liberation, the riches of liberated slaves, you know, to, um, to develop tools, you know, to develop tools for teaching the, the, the the, the, the question, the issue of slave, more broadly, the issue of slaves in Senegambia and in West Africa, that is one important issue. And um, um, also to develop tools, you know, for um, um, exploring different ways of, of, of liberation. And the, the, the one important, uh, interest of that issue is to teach to the young generation the issue of slaves, you know, and the, the meaning of that are the social status, you know, and to see how the young generation will react um, considering, you know, the, 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 that institution as a slave, you know, as, as the enslavement of, um, of, of, of people, you know, uh, in the, during the, during the uh, from the 14th century up to the 20th century. And we know that in, uh, there is still some, some, 
some marks, you know, um, uh, other 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 social status, especially in uh, in, uh, in 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 some village, and we still have some um, uh, some. Um, um, uh, uh, some so, some marks, you know, which uh, uh, show the tradition, the youth of uh, the the tradition of, of slaves in, uh, in, uh, in 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 Senegambia. So the we 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 are uh, very um, engaged uh, in um, uh, exploiting in in using the database, you know, and uh, to, to explore with our colleagues in the secondary school, as well as in, uh, at first step, you know, with the young uh, uh, the student who had been prepared, you know, to, um, to see the way to develop um, uh, pedagogical tools, you know, no, 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 nowadays, you know, it is very easier to uh, using YouTube, you know, to develop uh, um, what we call capsule, you know, which is a kind of uh, um, uh, 10 minutes, you know, 10 minutes of um, uh, registered uh, lesson part of the, of the, of the pedagogical application. Uh, on one uh, issue and uh, to to share it, you know, not only with our colleagues in uh, in uh, in, uh, in Senegal, but also to see how from uh, schools in the United States, you know, involved in the project, we can share uh, pedagogical resources, you know, from 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 both sides, you know, so. We, we intend to create a community of of uh, of learning and teaching um, the issue of of slavery uh, in uh, in West Africa and um, to um, to um, um, uh, in the in in, uh, in in pedagogical dimension as well as you know to um, go deeply in exploring um, some research question linked to the abolition of, of slavery in, in Senegal. And my colleague Ibrahim Sek told me that, you know, we have a young uh, student, you know, which might be involved in a, in a research uh, for a master degree. Uh, I talked with the head of the department of FASTEF. And also uh, we have identified a young, uh, um, uh, uh, Trinity teachers, you know, which are willing, you know, to be involved in, in, in that dimension. So let's um, give the floor to Ibrahim to, you know, to give more additional um, information. Sorry, I, I forgot to unmute myself. Yes. Thank you so much, Professor Babakar Fall. Not Fall, but Fall. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard, and uh, everybody who's uh, attending today, the students. And uh, as a former school, a high school teacher for about 20 years, and also working a lot with Babakar Fall, who used to be the Secretary General of the History and Geography Teachers Association of Senegal. Later, myself, I was elected to be the Secretary General, the leader of that association. I am deeply sensitive to the issue of linking the academia, the higher academia, and also uh, the level that is below. I mean, uh, high school and maybe even lower than, uh, than high school. The knowledge has to go to the people, to the teenagers, people who are going, I think that is really important. And also for a few years, I worked with Professor Ibrahim Achub. We did work a lot about slavery. And that's, how, that's when I first discovered about these uh, uh, liberation uh, registers 
And we started uh, working on those, but we did not create a, a database uh, whatsoever. So I'm glad that you had this idea to digitize them. And that, will, that means that they will be available to the, to the people. Uh, and uh, I give my word that I will be deeply involved in this, in this project and uh, have also my university involved in this. I was just uh, uh, not nominated as French. I was just appointed as the director of one of the labs for our doctoral school called ETHOS, Etude de l'Homme et de la Société, the study of uh, you know, uh, people and society. And uh, one of the labs is called CART. CART is Centre African de Recherche sur les Traites et les Esclavages, the African Center of, uh, of Research on uh, uh, slavery and, 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 and the slave trade. We started it years ago, and now it is one of the labs for our doctoral school. And my intention is to hire as many as I can whenever I find uh, some students who are, whom I trust that can do the job, I will get them involved. Like uh, Babakar mentioned it, uh, earlier, I have found a, a very good student. Uh, he speaks English very well and uh, really brilliant. His name is Mohammed Silla. He is my first recruit for, the, uh, for this project, and I will uh, do uh, my best to get uh, many other uh, students involved. And uh, since I'm a member of uh, the University of Dakar, FASTEF is also another school linked to the University of Dakar. I think we, make, we can make the jun junction between Stanford, uh, let's say, uh, the University of Dakar, the School of Education, uh, FASTEF. I think uh, that's something possible I, I, I can do. And uh, most of the people who teach over there now are my former students. I think uh, it would be also a pleasure for me to go back to the School of Education and do something uh, on my, upon my return to, to the Senegal. I'm, I'm really drifting back to Senegal from uh, uh, that Whitney, Whitney plantation. So absolutely we'll need to train those people. The, the, the problem of our students is a problem of training. Very few of them have computers. And we have also a very deep need to, to get them some training about how to use, I mean, about databases, <clears throat> mapping and all of the things. That's uh, something we should put on the agenda. And uh, now, I love that idea when uh, Richard mentioned that, you know, uh, or maybe it was uh, Rebecca, the place where the people were born and where they, where they went to seek freedom. This uh, uh, took back to, into my mind, uh, did get back into my mind, a project uh, in which I'm involved in Louisiana with the University of New Orleans called uh, Freedom on, on the Move, Mapping Runaway Slaves. So we collected data all over Louisiana and especially the, the German coast of Louisiana near New Orleans, uh, cases of runaway slaves. So we follow them and uh, wherever they went, we put that on the map and we call it Freedom on, on the Move. And I think we have data here in this, uh, uh, liberation registers to, to do that. Uh, yes. So I have a question about, uh, uh, I know I was reading uh, an article earlier about uh, these uh, uh, liberated uh, slaves. And I know that we have also many cases of uh, trials like, uh, Children who were taken, you know, who were put under the custody of a family or whatever and were abused, some of them sexually abused. And I know that there are trials about that. So, and it looks like uh, uh, right now the project is just focused on the, the registers. The moment when people went to get, to, to, to get uh, their freedom. So, I think we should include those trials 
maybe you did it already. I don't know. I'm, I'm just asking the. I'm just asking the the the, the, the question. So. And I think we can do a lot about the, the databases. And one of the things we, we can do, uh, Professor Baba Karfal mentioned it earlier about, uh, you know, having uh, the trainees, the people who are being trained to be teachers, uh, making those capsules. Maybe I can translate it as a, a, a podcast about uh, about slavery. We have a lot. I think we have a lot of information in these. Uh, registers and also the trials to really put down uh, what we call in French, récit de vie, life stories. I know that uh, identifying the enslaved people in uh, the United States, I don't think it is uh, so far that it is a big problem. We know uh, about the slave narrative that were collected by the Federal Writers Project. The former slaves were clearly identified who was the master. And also there was no uh, editing whatsoever, I think. But I know that the Catholic church did, uh, did not accept uh, people to uh, uncover like the identities of the people who were on those uh, sacramental records, uh, especially about the color. They published 20 volumes of the sacramental records, baptism and death, but uh, they, they don't mention the color of the skin of the people. That's Louisiana. Some people pass for white and, and, and understand that. On our side, identifying the people uh, may be a problem because uh, like you did show it earlier, slavery is a status. Even if you were liberated 100 years ago, it follows you into the present. It cannot be effaced. You cannot erase it. So identifying the people is a problem. But now, and I did talk to Professor Baba Karfal about it last night, is that from uh, like the 19th century to now, we don't think that people have uh, that long memory of enslavement and uh, I think we will miss a lot uh, if we go ahead and write those those Reci de V life stories without uh, uncovering the identities. And those people will just remain like shadows with no identity. And I think we can continue the discussion. And to me, in my own conviction, it is really important to move from shadows you know, to people with real identity. Uh, I think that's a work of memory we, we, we must do. That's just my idea. That's what I think about naming the enslaved people who are in those registers. Thank you so much again. And uh, I have a question. I remember reading uh, Dr. I mean, uh, Roberts. I wrote the, 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 pre, the, the, primary, pre, the preliminary analysis of those uh, uh, records, what you, what you recorded, uh, I mean, what you collected uh, so far, but I don't remember seeing, or I forgot about the, the, the explanation why the collection so far is just from 1894 to 1903. What about from 1857 to, 1893. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ibrahima. Uh, also, uh, Babakar, uh, Rebecca, and Richard. Uh, time is against us. However, the uh, there's such a rich, uh, uh, so many rich topics of conversation here um, that uh, please do stay with us for another uh, 10 minutes or so, so we can engage at least begin the conversation that we've, uh, that's part of our broader project. Um, I think um, the, um, yes, uh, would anyone like to respond um, immediately to, um, to Ibrahima before we uh, take um, questions from audience? So I'm happy to respond to Ibrahima. <clears throat> One of the things that we decided to do with our first pool of research assistants 
was to use the most recent records because they were in better condition. The earlier records are more, they, they, they demonstrate they have more deterioration and therefore they're harder to use. And what we wanted to do was to begin and get momentum. So our plan of course is now to continue the rest of them to, to include all of them from 1857 onward. And that's our task is to flesh out that period. But we wanted to get the framework for how best to do this going as quickly as we could to develop momentum. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, I, well, uh, yes, um, yes I, Professor Fall. Yes, I would add that, you know, uh, the register is uh, an entry point, you know, for uh, uh, developing research question, you know, to make it more large, broader about the issue of um, of slavery in, uh, in 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 West Africa, and I think uh, considering um, what have been done on the ground, you know, with uh, with uh, with the laboratory cut, uh, considering also what have been done with the. Um, scholars in in the US you know and um, 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 and elsewhere you know I think uh, we intended you know to uh, uh, develop a new um, a new corpus you know a, a new a new a new field of research you know which will uh, be an important moment to share knowledge with, with young generation and um, um, and to analyze the how the young generation will react facing the impact of uh, ancient like slavery in our society because I think it is important to question our society and uh, um, to see how young generation will will react with what kind of opinion they will have when we share knowledge with him about the social, some social issue like the social status, you know, because we are now, we are now in a, in an environment, in a social environment in which, you know, all people are considered as to be equal, you know, but it was not the case, you know, in, in the past and how, how to, to bring young people to discover the our, our societies you know and um, some important uh, ch uh, change the society had been living you know with the uh, uh, an, an, an institution like the slavery you know I, it, it, it's why for me the interest of this register is to consider it as an entry point you know to develop a broader research you know which will uh, be a bridge between uh, the past and uh, the, young, the young generation. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I see um, uh, some at, in, the, in the chat, uh, Karen and Richard, would you like to um, comment on anything uh, in, in that? Um, well, Karen had the question about uh, the unaccompanied minors. And one of the fascinating things is that most of the unaccompanied minors were female. And so there was a tremendous demand, not only in Senegal, but also in the Atlantic world for children during this last phase of, of uh, the slave trade. But in Senegal itself, the, these unaccompanied minors were part of an apprentice, so-called apprentice system, when in fact there were, as Ibrahima had mentioned, the significant abuses were prevalent within that system. And there is a legal trail of complaints 
the systems of oversight were pretty weak, of course. Um, but there are two researchers who are working on this. One is Kelly uh, Duke Bryant at Rowan University in Virginia. And the other is Bernard Moit at, I believe it's uh, Vir Virginia, University Chris of Virginia, University. Or Virginia Tech. Virginia Christian University. Virginia Christian. So that Bernard yeah. Moyd is, is, has a book that's now yeah. in process that's coming out with the Cambridge, Cambridge University Press African Studies series on this. Thank you very much, um, Richard. Um, Nigel, you had a question? Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to start by saying this has been an absolutely fascinating presentation for for, for me, and I think for those of us who, who are just beginning to think about so many of the issues that you've raised and, and are working through. Um, and, and my question really comes from the, the issue of participation um, and the role that, that, that your project can play in opening up other means of, of engagement. Uh, schools you've discussed, um, and, and also descendants and, and people uh, of, of, uh, in, in, in Senegalese society. Um, and I wondered, one of the questions we have just begun to think about in our work, and we're at a very, very early stage in comparison to you, but one of the issues we've begun to think about is whether it would be possible uh, to have um, a platform of some kind which will enable uh, anyone um, to be able to uh, add uh, into the, the, the project, to, to open up discussion, to, as you know, we're thinking of something like a blog, but, but a blog which, has, which is linked more directly to the data that we're, we're presenting. It does, of course, assume that people are going to have technological access, which, uh, as you, you have said, is an issue in, in your schools and certainly is in, in, in the areas that we work in in, in South Africa. Um, but I wondered if this is an issue which, which you have thought about or, or if you have some response to that or, or ideas about that, which, uh, which, which will, would be helpful, very helpful for us. But again, thank you for such a fascinating presentation. Um, I, Kerry, did you want to comment um, uh, on the top of that, or shall we uh, ask the, uh, the speakers to uh, respond first? Yeah, it, it is actually on kind of the same issue, and um, it's both a response and a comment. As I see uh, what's happening with the um, Slave Voyages database at, at Rice, and I would encourage um, you know the thinking about the database uh, pedagogically not only within, um, within history, like within history classes pedagogically, but reaching out to um, uh, computer science and, um, and social science students who work with data. What we're finding, I don't work directly with the Slave Voyages database uh, at Rice at the moment, but um, uh, what we're finding with the kinds of, of data um, that uh, actually uh, computer scientists are really interested, students are really interested in doing kind of hands-on um, projects that, that help the database, help, help think about the database in, in different ways. Um, and the other um, aspect of that, I think, is um, the one thing that I, I would encourage is uh, the Slave Voyages database has a, a page um, that links to um, lesson plans so that teachers can actually upload lesson plans that they're using. And I think that's a really useful innovation. If it's, if it's open, then it's both pedagogically interesting in terms of, of um, what schools and what teachers are teaching what, but also that opens up a discussion about how these subjects get taught across education systems and in different countries. And that would be wonderful. And that's something that the Slave Voyages um, database does not have. All their lesson plans are, are based um, uh, from American schools. I think that that would be absolutely amazing to think about that aspect of it, of broadening out, of broadening out the, the contributions. 
Um, thank you very much. Uh, would anyone like to respond to that? We also uh, have um, a, a final question from uh, Joel. But before we get to that, uh, any responses uh, to Nigel and Kerry? Well, thanks both of you for your comments um, and also your questions. And so first, um, you know, Carrie, what you were suggesting is so along the lines of what we are hoping to do. It's it's very, I, very paradoxical, right? So you would think that being at Stanford, we would be rich in computer science undergraduates to work on this, especially with SESTA. The, the, um, so we are, you know, hoping to have an intern from there work with us on the project. At times so far, I definitely jump in, Richard. I think we've had a lot of competition from industry for interns. So trying to kind of market that kind of come up with a position description to really take advantage of the institutional strength is something that would be hugely beneficial. Um, and from my perspective regarding accessibility, one thing that we've talked about um, that I would really love to see is to try to, since we're still in the process of making our web interface, it would be great if it were optimized for mobile devices just because this is such a key way that people access internet globally. So that would make um, a lot better accessibility. So I think trying to think about all stakeholders and end users going in, um, because something like Slave Voyages has been around such a long time um, and they have, it's, it's, it's really so advanced compared to our work, but maybe because we're getting started with these multiple constituencies in mind, we can think that way from the get go. Um, so that was what, what I would add, but I, I really appreciate all both of your comments and found them really um, resonant with how we've been thinking about things. Just a quick addendum. I want to thank both Kerry and, and Nigel for the kind of work you've both been doing on. It's so foundational for the kind of way we think about uh, enslavement more generally within the world system. But I just want to quickly mention that Michigan State University has a platform funded by the Mellon Foundation that will eventually, but its goal is to try to amalgamate many of these, these digital projects together on one central platform. Because one of the things we've worried about and we've noticed is that it takes a lot of energy and commitment to sustain them over time. And one of the things that the Mellon program is designed to do through Michigan State is to create a common set of ways of sustaining these digital projects so that they have a life beyond just the limited research capacity of individual scholars. Indeed, sustainability is, is uh, a very big issue that's not always immediately um, visible or on the agenda uh, in the initial excitement flash of opportunity. Um, but uh, let's uh, hear uh, Joel's question as, as the final uh, question. Thank you, Grant. Uh, Richard and Rebecca, it would be helpful to hear a bit more about how you plan to deal with the ethical issues to which you pointed, Richard. Uh, as you're well, well aware, the very act of description is perceived by some people in itself as offensive. And then there becomes the issue of who's doing the presenting and the notion that some categories of presenters have greater legitimacy than others or none at all. So it would be really helpful to hear how you plan to address that since this is a powerful ongoing issue for all academics involved in the kinds of work that you're doing. Thanks. Yeah, that's such an important question. We've been giving it a ton of thought um, ever since we began, but especially um, in 2020, we presented at ASA. I don't know if you were able to attend this panel and we had really lively conversation about exactly this. Um, from my point of view, it's really, really important that it's a transnational project that's involving um, like people from all over the world. Um, so I think that's part of the equation, but it's something that we're sussing out. So as we alluded to, right, we're having an entire um, workshop this fall to try to think through some of these issues. I don't think there's an easy answer at this point. Um, I'm, and if there is from one of my co-project managers, it would be great to hear it now and not kind of be waiting on tender hooks. Um, but I think that um, just trying to involve as many stakeholders as possible who do come from um, different groups globally is really important. Um, because, yeah, it does ring kind of, it, it, it's a little um, off-putting for it to be just, you, you know, cited only in California, 
when it's dealing with dynamics that while in the past are very resonant today. So I think that trying to involve educators, trying to, you know, having partners who are located at Senegalese institutions, talking to secondary educators. I think that like having as many different voices who can bring to bear different perspectives would really help to A, come up with the best way to talk about things, but B, ensure that as many different impacted groups can have a stake in how these issues are talked about. So I'm sure Richard has things to add to that, but that's how I think about them. But it's, it's something you have to continually think through. I think the uh, to to end on a note that there's uh, more to do, but to do so with uh, great excitement and uh, uh, renewed uh, reminders of uh, many themes, challenges, opportunities, and resources that we have in common. Uh, uh, let me uh, that would be a good note to end, but not without. Uh, thanking um, Babaka, Ibrahima, Rebecca, and uh, Richard for a very wonderful discussion. And uh, we look forward to continuing the discussion as soon as um, next week, if you're able. Uh, uh, would you like to say just a word about that, uh, Stefani? Yes, so thank you again. It was really exciting. And uh, I really learned a lot also from my project. Uh, yes, I wanted to, do, uh, I hope you will be able to join us next Thursday, the same time, the same place, and we are going uh, to present about history of slavery and material culture, can objects help us understand the lives of enslaved people, uh, by Anna Lucia Arauia from Harvard University in Washington, D.C. So I hope you'll be able to, to join us uh, and you will receive more information from me. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Ibrahim, probably Ibrahim will say something. Sorry, you were muted. Yeah, uh, it will be the same time. And yes. you'll send a link? Yes. OK. And uh, I think we can probably invite uh, some scholars you know, to join us. Mm. Absolutely. You can circulate on this. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, we can invite Stefania, students. To yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you again. Have a nice Thank day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.